Shabbat Shalom. This is Shabbat Vegash, and we're looking again uh, at Yaakov and his family. I hope you've had a wonderful Hanukkah, and um, as we return to the uh, the book of Bereshit, we look now at um, catching up with Yaakov. What will become of them? Well, here's a here's a recap of where we are. Due to a, a severe famine in Canaan, where they were living, the land of promise, the sons of Yaakov have been forced to travel to Egypt to purchase food. Because, of course, we know Egypt had food during this famine, and it was because of Yosef and his ability given by God to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Now, what has happened is that the youngest son, that is Yosef's younger brother, Binyamin, has been imprisoned by the ruler of Egypt as insurance that his brothers will keep their promise to, as it turns out, Yosef. Will be, this be the end of uh, the children of Raquel? Yosef has lost, and now Benjamin has been taken captive by the rulers of Egypt. Having lost Benjamin's brother, how will their father bear yet another tragedy? Well, surprisingly, Yehuda, now remember, this is the brother who suggested selling Yosef to the Midianites. Yosef, uh, Yehuda came forward to plead for his brother's life with the ruler that they were dealing with. And here some unusual language is used. Vayagash Elev Yehuda. Yehuda encountered him. Vayagash from the root Chagash, to come close or to prepare, is a somewhat unusual choice of words given that Yehuda and Yosef were actually in the same room. The Midrash suggests that the term Vayagash reflects three types of of possible preparations. Preparation for war, preparation for mediation or diplomacy, preparation for prayer, that is interceding with Hashem. And Yehuda steps forward toward several potential actions. So this doesn't really tell us very much about what his intentions are. But to whom does the elev refer? Some mystical commentators among our people suggest that the elev to whom this verse refers is Hashem, that the speech was given by Yehuda, and it was actually not an argument to Pharaoh's representative, but re in reality it was a prayer. A second possible person to whom Yehuda turns is himself, looking inwardly. He is reevaluating the events for himself in order to clarify the issues before speaking. And only then, Yehuda realized, only then, after possibly conferring with Hashem, possibly thinking back to himself. Only then did Yehuda realize how committed he was to saving his brother Binyamin. In fact, 
he was so committed to this action that he was willing to give up his own life for his brother. This, of course, is a, is a radical turnabout for one who partially, at least, entered, engineered Yosef's enslavement. However, if we follow the logic of the text, after Yehuda's successful speech, Yosef breaks down. He reveals that he really is their brother. And again, Yaakov resumes centrality as we moved, move to the next, in fact, this week's parasha. First, perhaps, we should consider Yosef's own experiences. Yosef knew Hashem. He knew Hashem, and undoubtedly he had expectations. What are your expectations of God? What did he have a right to expect from God? What do we have a right to expect from God? If a righteous God only does good things, why is it that only, why is it that good things didn't happen to Yosef? You know, that this kind of, this question was actually asked of Rav Yeshua. A man came to him and said, it was a man who was, who was disabled, and he said, did this man sin, or was it his father? So, did Yosef sin, or did his father sin to bring about this calamity upon Yosef? The truth is that God is a just God. Yosef had no intrinsic right even to the good things that he'd already enjoyed before his enslavement. What about all the other people who lived at the time of Yosef? Did, did they deserve slavery and misery, early death, capture, all the other things that happened to people? And if you think of yourself, if you think of yourself, and you say, why did this happen to me? The other question you should ask is, why it shouldn't it have happened to you? Should it have happened to somebody else? As a person who worshiped the one true God, Yosef could expect that God would work in his life so that he might become a person of character and substance. God had objectives for Yosef's life, which Yosef had no understanding of. And Yosef, Yosef changed during those many years. And he became more the person that God had created him to be. Would this have happened? if he had stayed with his family. And what did he have the right to expect from his brothers? Well, sometimes we know our brothers, both physical and spiritual, fail to live up to our expectations, as we often fail to live up to their expectations. Have you ever thought of it that way? Are our expectations of others too great? Or are theirs of us? We need to think about these things. And I'm sure that Yosef considered whether or not goodness, righteousness, was worth the cost 
that he paid for his response to Potiphar's wife. How many times along the way might Yosef have said, what has righteous living ever done for me? The psalmist asked that question. In fact, there are several psalms that, that deal with this issue of living righteously when you look around and see the unrighteous doing so well. Maybe, maybe you have thought at times, what has righteousness ever done for me? when you've been wrongfully attacked, betrayed by others. So we have to look at what God accomplished through these events in Yosef's life. He didn't bring them about. We know that um, the beginning of all of that was, was in the hands of Yosef's brothers, but what did he accomplish? The brother's treatment of Yosef was humiliating. It was frightening. It was hurtful. It was betrayal. And yet we hear nothing of fear, rage, or desire for revenge from Yosef. The episode in Potiphar's house brought Yosef to prison, but he speaks no evil against Potiphar or or his lascivious wife? And what of his experience in prison? He did not have a great prison experience. We're told in another place that his, his, um, his feet were damaged, his, perhaps his legs even were damaged by being in irons. We don't know exactly what this treatment was, but, but we know that Prison trained Yosef in servanthood and humility. It taught him patience, and it gave him the ability to endure hardship. Maybe you don't think you should have to endure any hardship, but that may be one of the things that happens in your life. Yosef, through all of these things, learned perseverance, persistence in the face of adversity. And during his so sojourn in prison, Yosef learned to listen to Hashem. He tuned in to what God was doing in his life rather than focusing on his rights or on feeling sorry for himself. Yosef the dreamer became Yosef the interpreter of dreams. Called before Pharaoh, the ruler of one of the mightiest empires on earth. Who could have imagined such a thing? Was this the same Yosef who presented his own dreams to his family for their edification and enlightenment? Notice the difference in his attitude as he unfolds the ramifications of Pharaoh's dream as compared with the way in which he explained his youthful dreams to his family. Yosef was placed in a position of power and authority over all of Egypt. This was a, a tremendous opportunity for him to get his own back with all of those who had wronged him, from Potiphar with his malicious, immoral wife, to those who had abused him in prison. And power over his brothers for good or evil, was given into his hands. 
But God knew that Yosef was prepared and ready for each test. Yosef's mature character demonstrates these qualities goodness, righteousness, wisdom, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and brotherly affection. Those are qualities in many cases which are not valued in the world we live in. But Rav Shimon Kifa tells us that if we have these qualities in abundance, we will be kept from being barren and unfruitful. Yosef became a patriarch in his own right, a man of substance and wisdom, a man who understood and supported God's objectives. Through God's plan for Yosef, our people survived. God moved his people to Egypt for his purpose, and he used the famine and Yosef to do it. He even used the malignant spirit of Israel's other sons to accomplish his purpose. Who could have imagined all of this when Yosef was a young boy? certainly not his brothers. One might even view Yosef as Mashiach's understudy. Yosef's brothers came back from Egypt with the knowledge that Yosef was alive, but they did not know how to tell their father. How do you tell someone that you have lied to them all these years and what you did, your part in the lie. Ya Yaakov had been inconsolable over the loss of his beloved younger son. He probably prayed every day that he would see his son again, despite what he'd heard. But he couldn't believe, perhaps in his heart, that these prayers would be answered. Perhaps Yosef's brothers feared that when they told Yaakov that Yosef was alive, he would have a heart attack from the shock. They didn't know how to tell him in a way that he would be able to assimilate, and in reality, that his prayers had been answered. This yearning and longing experienced by Yaakov for his favored son is similar to the longing we have experienced as a people, as a nation, for the coming of Mashiach. The crucial step in redemption is actually the moment before redemption. It is the preparation needed to be able to entertain the notion that years or, or generations of suffering are coming to an end. Just as Yaakov's desire was to hear the proclamation that he would see Yosef again, so we long to see Mashiach's return. And the moment before that return, when our people will cry, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Torah mentions all those who went to Egypt with Yaakov. And they took their cattle and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and they came to Mizraim, Yaakov, and all his descendants with him, his sons, his son's sons with him, his daughters, his son's daughters, his daughter's daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him 
to Mitzrayim. All of his sons and daughters, his son's children, his daughter's children, and their children, all of them went with him to Egypt. No one was left behind in Canaan. The family of Yaakov began a new and different life in Egypt. The implication is also clear that several hundred years later, when Yaakov's descendants left Egypt and slavery, all of them, all of his descendants, went up from Egypt to follow God. Yosef was promised that upon leaving Egypt, his bones would be taken for burial in Eretz Yisrael. This is a reminder of the assurance held by the patriarch of our family that we would return to our own land, the land of promise given to us by Hashem. His assurance was also our assurance that God would not leave us or forsake us in Egypt, but would be with us and would restore us as a family and as a nation to the land of promise. We read in Yahashua, and Yosef's bones, which the B'nai Yisrael had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Yaakov bought for a hundred pieces of silvers, silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Yosef's descendants. Hashem had objectives for Yosef's life. And he has objectives for your life, too. As with Yosef, God's greatest desire for you may come as a shock. It is to build your character, not provide for your pleasure. This is his plan for you. Romans 8.29 those whom he knew in advance, he also determined in advance, would be conformed to the pattern of his son, the paradigm of Mashiach Yeshua. As children of God, belonging to his one and only people, this should also be our desire but let's be honest, for many of us, being conformed to the image of Mashiach takes second place to our own enjoyment of life, having our own way, finding activities that please us and make us feel good, taking it easy, getting along and not making waves, wanting people to like us avoiding anything that is difficult or painful. As with Yosef, <clears throat> pardon me, the difficulties, the struggles, the hurts, the sorrows, the stresses of life, the very things that we might seek to avoid, these produce the greatest growth in our lives and bring us to maturity. They bring out those qualities in us that God desires. And so God is not likely to move any of these out of your path. Although he promises that he will be with you through everything, never leaving or forsaking you, he will not divert hardship from your doorstep. He promises to provide all of your needs in accordance with his superior knowledge of what those needs might be, but not in keeping with your 
wish list. God allows each struggle to make you stronger and causes each sorrow to make you more compassionate as he is compassionate. Remember his 13 characteristics of mercy. He can use each experience you would like to evade or avoid to create yet another positive character trait in you, conforming to the paradigm of Mashiach means following Torah, focusing on the presence of Hashem in your life, and living as Rav Yeshua lived with strength of purpose, compassion, and centered always in the objectives and power of God. We've, we've seen God's dealings with Yosef, but remember the good God was accomplishing could only be seen in retrospect. Yosef was primed to be the savior of his family, the house of Israel. For the salvation and future of our people, God's chosen nation, Israel's future in Egypt was assured until it was time, God's time, for the nation and people of Israel to move on. Looking back over the year 2021, and despite COVID and its complications and whatever personal struggles that you've experienced, can you see the good that God has been doing in your life? You need to ask yourself that question. If not, perhaps your vision is poor or your sight is skewed by disappointment, regret, fear, anger, bitterness, or dissatisfaction. Have you missed have you ignored the goodness and mercy that Melech David experienced and wrote about in Tehillim 23? His life, his life was not easy. Remember all the years of running and being chased by King Shaul and, and his men. He did not have an easy time. But he could look back over his life and see goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life. We see the way Hashem worked in Yosef's life. But what is God's place in your life? Be honest with yourself. Have you consciously thought about God's objectives for you, within you, and through you? Has God's presence been a, a constant reality during this last year? Is God's power real to you, in you, and through you to others? Have you spent the last 12 months trying to avoid God's objectives for your life? Or can you say that you have sought to know God's purpose in each situation and event and to operate within that purpose? Can you look back over this secular year and see a maturing process? spiritual growth, greater usefulness to Hashem, or not? If not, why not? Have you been resist, resisting or restricting God's efforts to bring change in your life? 
Are you pursuing Hashem's objectives? Rav Shaul speaks to us from our Ketuvim HaMashikim reading this morning, Philippians 3, verse 12 through 4, verse 1. So I'm going to read part of it again. It's not that I've already reached the goal. No, I keep pursuing it in the hope of taking hold of that for which Mashiach Yeshua took hold of me. I, for my part, do not think of myself as having gotten hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what lies ahead, I keep pursuing the goal. What goal? God's goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in Mashiach Yeshua. We are citizens of heaven, of the world to come. And it is from there that we expect a deliverer, the Lord Yeshua the Mashiach. He will change the bodies that we have in this humble state and make them like his glorious body, his resurrection body, using the power which enables him to bring everything under his control. So keep standing firm in union with Adonai. Through the narrative of Bereshit, we say, see God's objectives for Yosef's life. But Hashem also has objectives for your life. Pursue these objectives in order to win the promised reward, the prize extended to all who belong to God as they persevere and complete the race. But first, you must bury the failures of 2021, and we all have them, and move forward into the successes that Hashem has for you in 2022. Take time to reassess your standing with God and covenant with Him, agree with Him, to make your relationship more intimate. God promises to draw near to us if we draw near to him. Consider how you spend your energy and time and ask yourself if you're missing out on what's really important, missing many blessings as well. Do you spend your energy on mindless pursuits rather than on investing it in what really matters for eternity? Expand your horizons and expect more of yourself. Stretch towards what lies ahead as Rav Shaul did because you believe Hashem is proactive in your life and in our world. Anticipate spiritual growth and development in 2022 and do something new to make this a reality. Challenge yourself to read at least a chapter of the scriptures every single day. <clears throat> Pardon me. Make a prayer list and pray for those on it regularly, daily even. Improve your Hebrew or learn it and read the parasha in Hebrew every week. Be excited 
about what God will do in you and through you. See opportunities rather than situations or problems. Seek ways in which to bless and encourage others rather than waiting for them to bless and encourage you. Follow the pattern set by those who've gone before us and avoid those who are not faithful to this pattern or to Hashem. Examine the lives of the men and women who are used by God for his purpose. Look at the way in which he stretched them to go beyond what they thought they could do. In the same way that athletes are stretched to do their best. Follow the pattern of holiness and righteousness that we see in the godly men and women of the scripture. And having done this, go forward with anticipation, knowing that God will provide learning and maturing opportunities in your life so that you can expand your horizons and develop your full spiritual potential. If you cannot now say, it is well with my soul, ask yourself why. And now covenant with God to walk faithfully with him in 2022. Commit yourself to daily prayer and reading from the scriptures and don't allow even one day to pass without keeping that commitment. Begin and end the day by saying the Shema and thinking about what God means in your life. Live a holy life by following God's express commands and his plan. Don't operate according to your own agenda and your own desires. Affirm God's power in your life. In Philippians 4, 4, 6, and 8, we read, Rejoice in union with the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Don't worry about anything. On the contrary, make your requests known to God by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. In conclusion, focus your thoughts on what is true, noble, righteous, pure, lovable, or admirable, on some virtue, on something praiseworthy. Forget all that negative stuff. Focus on these positive attributes. Affirm God as Melek, as king of your life in everything you do and say. Keep your heart and mind focused on what is truly valuable and eternal. Don't allow your life to be filled with fear, stress, hurt, and anxiety. Look to God for answers concerning every issue in your life. Keep standing firm in union with Adonai. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Hashem is with you as we look toward 2022. Keep that in mind. It's as if you're going on a journey. He's, ta he's going with you. He's leading the way. He is your guide. He is your guard. He gives you direction. He has objectives for this year in your life. 
seek them out and follow them. I pray that you'll have a good week, a wonderful Shabbat, and I hope to see you next week. God bless and keep you. Shalom.